Hey, what's going on, guys? So, of course, uh, we have a special guest here today. Super excited about this podcast. This is a topic that a lot of our clients and just people in general are curious about. And so, uh, so I want to introduce my guest today, uh, physician assistant or associate, yes. Anya Wallace. So, Anya, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so good to have you here. So first and foremost, uh, I want the people out there to know who you are, a little bit of your background. Yeah. Uh, you got some pretty cool hobbies too, but I, I'll, <laughs> save, I'll save those for, for later. Yeah. Uh, but kind of talk about your, uh, your, your medical uh, background and, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, for sure. So I got my undergrad degree from University of South Carolina in exercise right. science. Gamecocks, okay. Um, Worked for a year as a medical assistant, uh, both in orthopedics and in like an indigent clinic for primary care. And then from there, I went to PA school at Wingate. Um, it's about a two and a half year program. Uh, originally wanted to go into orthopedic surgery, but I did my rotations with Dr. Jorge and he kind of sucked me in. So I've like like been it. with him for about 10 years now. Ten, wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's like working with your brother. <laughs> um, good. yeah. So worked with mm -hmm. him, um, we did the traditional primary care thing. Oh, yeah. um, probably a few years into practice, three, four years maybe, we started getting into like the functional medicine fields. Um, we tried to implement it in this very busy practice we had and just like it. didn't really work. Um, so he drops on me one day that he's kind of going to go off and do his own thing. I was like, yeah. cool, I'm going with you. Love it. And uh, so, yeah. So I went and kind of – Dove really more into the functional medicine side. Specifically, I do a lot with hormones. Um, I also do some things with like ADHD because I myself have ADHD and I know wow. nothing about it. Um, so yeah, I do hormones, ADHD. Yeah. I do all the gut stuff, everything else the doctor already does, but I, yeah. that's kind of my niche. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. And uh, we, we did a previous podcast with Dr. Jorge. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so, you know, if folks follow our, our podcast and follow our channel, they can kind of go back and see... Uh, that interview with Dr. Jorge. So uh, you came to our health and fitness conference. I did. Yeah, yes. and you hit a home run. <laughs> I had a full house, and the first one I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, you did. So kind of uh, I'll let you take the thunder on this one. Can you talk about what you what you what what your topics were during the, uh, the conference? Yeah, so I focused primarily on what was menopause, but then I dove really more into, okay, what does that look like on the exercise? Mm. I primarily exercise, but I touched a little bit on nutrition front. Um, given I have an exercise background, I've been an athlete yeah. my whole life. Um, mm. and I, I do see a, primarily women as clients. Um, and because of like how the culture of exercise is, you know, it's like, Oh, more cardio, eat less, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And women are so concerned with weight and mm. And I am huge on getting women into strength training. Like um, so I really wanted to dive into, okay, what is happening in menopause? What does that actually mean? Because it's like, oh, menopause, this is this thing yeah. that we that is going to happen. But what happens hormonally and how, what do those hormones actually do? And how does exercise and nutrition directly affect those hormones so that you can feel better without having to get into potential risks of treating and whatnot? I love it. I love it. And uh, that class was an uh, overwhelming <laughs> success. <laughs> success. Well, we, yeah, yeah, we almost had to turn people away. So uh, so starting with that, let's talk about some of those hormone changes in women. Yeah. Because, of course, hormone changes can be overwhelming. It can catch people off guard when they're not ready for it. So kind of talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I'll give kind of a, a definition, I suppose, of menopause, perimenopause, all these different phrases that are out there. So menopause at its base, most simple is your period stop for 12 months. Okay. Um, but what's happening underneath all of that is it's actually the ovaries stop producing follicles and mm. so you can no longer get pregnant. But before that actually happens, your body's going through all these different hormone changes. Um, so that is the perimenopausal phrase. Um, wow. And an easier way to kind of think about it is th take, you know, mm. Take a teenage girl and like this. That mm. is perimenopause is sometimes called second puberty um, wow. because hormones are doing this. Um, so any potential sign symptom that you may be getting as a teenage girl, you can also have to deal with in perimenopausal time frame. Right. Um, but on the hormonal side, the primary hormones we talk about are estrogens because there are actually three different types of estrogens. They all have different functions. 
Uh, you've got testosterone um, and quick side note on testosterone in women. Women actually have more testosterone than estrogen in their body. Wow. It's just compared to men, we have less. So I always tell women, like, do not be afraid of testosterone. It is a good thing. Um, but then also progesterone, those are kind of your primary sex hormones, if you will, that have to do with menopause. But you've also got cortisol as your stress hormone. You've got growth hormone and DHEA and all these different things that are directly contributing to some of these hormonal issues that women are facing. I love it. And of, of course, you know, uh, you will lead 99.9% uh, .9 of this conversation because <laughs> as a man, I have no knowledge of menopause. Uh, my clients, they ask us a lot of questions about how it, you know, modifications that should be done for somebody on menopause or mm -hmm. premenopause. So I kind of want to hit that. Is premenopause or menopause strictly related to age? No. Um, so there's a general kind of time frame. Um, most women are in menopause or have are postmenopausal, which means you've gone 12 months, 365 days without a period. Um, generally speaking, you will see perimenopausal time frame is ish 35 to 45 ish. Um, menopause is generally 45 ish to 53 ish. Postmenopause is after that. Now, if you're outside of that range, it doesn't necessarily mean anything is wrong. Um, risks can go up if you go into menopause later on, mm. um, especially if you get to like past age 55. There are some risks. Um, if you go into menopause prior to age 35, that's getting into something called premature ovarian mm. failure. That's something different. Um, and a quick side note, yes, you're a man, yeah. and but there are plenty yeah. of women that they don't know anything about menopause. Yeah. They And it's very generational as well. Like yeah. I've talked with women that <clears throat> – you know, they, they knew what a period was. They knew how to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. Menopause was just something you had to grin and bear it. And they watched their mom go through it, but they never had a conversation about mm -hmm. it. Um, there are still plenty of medical providers out there that are just like, yep, here, like have some birth control. Like, so you don't wow. have to deal with anything. And like, they send them mm -hmm. on their way. There's no education. There's no um, making women feel like there isn't something wrong with them. Wow. Um, so mm -hmm. you're not alone. I don't know. So what, what's that? So that was a good topic. I want to make sure some of these things, because uh, we we will kind of go through this interview and stuff like that. So there's some things that I kind of, if it jumps out to me, I'm going to ask you a go question because I'm learning some stuff yeah. too. So what is the, the I won't say, because every woman is going to be different, but what is the average window for menopause age-wise? Probably you're going to see an average of 45 to 50 okay. is going to be your, your closest kind of niche time frame. Mm -hmm. This will depend on a number of factors, though. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been pregnant? How early or late did you get pregnant? Mm -hmm. Are you on birth control pills? Um, what is your stress like? Are you overweight? Do you smoke? All of these things directly mm -hmm. affect your hormones, which will directly affect your age of onset of menopause. Yeah. So. No, I love it. And so um, kind of having an idea of what time period of life mm -hmm. to kind of look for some of those things. Um you know, people start to experience uh, different hormone-related things. So can you talk about the hormones involved with menopause? Yeah. So hormones involved in menopause, like I said earlier, is estrogens, uh, progesterone, and testosterone, and a little bit of DHEA. Um, there is this brain drawing that I do uh, for every new client, and I'm not an artist, but I'm a very visual learner, and I feel like with a lot of people who have never heard some of these mm -hmm. things – um, having a drawing for it and hearing all these crazy names it allows you to see how do the, all these things connect. Mm -hmm. um, so I talk about everything from thyroid to the adrenal glands to the ovaries. Um, I even talk a little bit about the gut and how the gut directly affects okay. all of these things. Um, but primarily speaking on the, the sex hormone side, so your estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, um, your estrogens have a lot of functions and it's not just your uterus. It's not just breast tissue, but it's also brain health and cardiovascular health and bone density, um, testosterone and DHEA. So testosterone is responsible. Not, it's not just for sex drive, although fun fact, the only FDA approved indication for testosterone in women is to improve their sex drive. It has well, nothing to do with, hey, yeah, let's increase your bone density. Let's help your cardiovascular health. Let's help yeah. you maintain muscle mass. Yeah. Um, which I got a little chip on my shoulder about that, but um, <laughs> yeah. all of these things are very important and they work together to really keep the body functioning optimally. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just about making babies. Yes, if you get down to how your brain is wired, it's 
survival of the species and reproduction. And if there's tons of stress happening, reproduction is going to go first, which is why when you get into like Mm -hmm. teenagers with athlete triad and um, women skipping periods and and all Mm -hmm. sorts of things, but I'll get on a tangent about that. (laughs) No, I like it. We're here to hear you talk. (laughs) Be on all the tangents you want. (laughs) So, uh, So real quick on this one. Um, just to kind of simplify it and make it a little bit less complicated for people out there who have no clue about menopause or, yeah. or for somebody like me, a man that just wants to be able to be a good support for yeah. his spouse. Um, what are some of those things that like sim- signs or symptoms yeah. to kind of clue you in that it could be the start of menopause? Yeah. Uh, there is a huge list. Okay. Uh, most common you were going to see hot flashes in women, Um, And hot flashes don't have to be the dramatic thing that you see on TV where it's like you're trying to strip all your clothes off and you're sweating. It could simply be, man, like I get a lot warmer. Like I want the house to be set to 63 degrees, whereas when I was 30, like I'm always cold. Um, It's this, you have this temperature set point that happens where when estrogen declines, that temperature set point gets a lot more narrow. So you Mm. are warmer at lower temperatures and you're colder at higher temperatures. Um, It gets into all sorts of brain chemistry and everything. That tends to be the biggest one. It doesn't have to be you wake up in a pool of sweat. Um, You can also see a decrease in sex drive. Uh, Mm. Women gain weight. That The three biggest I hear are sex drive, hot flashes, weight gain. Sleep is another one, but a lot of times women don't correlate menopause and hormones with sleep. Um, It can be anything and everything, acne, uh, brain fog, forgetfulness. The number of women that come in, they're like, I just can't remember anything. Like, I can't find words. Mm -hmm. Um, It was real fun during COVID when people were having all these, like, brain fog. And it's like, (laughs) is it COVID? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, But it can be a lot of things. And so the biggest thing I tell women whenever they come in, I'm like, I'm here to listen to you talk. Like, all these weird things that you're like, I don't know if it's this or I don't know if it's that. Like, give them all to me. I'll make the connections for you. Um, because sometimes it is a thyroid thing. Sometimes it is your gut. Sometimes it is your adrenals, but we have to take all that into account and say, okay, let's figure out what's causing that. I love it. And so, you know, this is really the the part that I'm super uh, <laughs> excited to hear about. What can women do on their own? So yes. I'm going into menopause. I want to know what to do. How can they mitigate some of the symptoms on their own before they, you know, of course, you know, if you need medical assistance, you need medical, you know, um, advice, we highly encourage that. That's why you're here today. Um, But what can they do on their own? Biggest three, sleep, exercise, nutrition. They are the hardest for people to do and to prioritize, but they are probably the most important. Sleep is a big superpower. Um, you, like it's your body and your brain's reset button. So you take all the mm-hmm. crap you went through during the day, mm-hmm. and if you get are, are getting good restful sleep, so you're getting into deep sleep, you're getting into REM sleep, it gives your body a chance to recuperate. So think about you had a super hard lifting workout and like everything hurts, and you go to bed and you're like, man, I'm gonna go to bed early. Like yeah. I'm hydrated, I've eaten enough protein. And you wake up and you're like, oh, okay, like I'm kind of sore, but it's not bad. But yeah. let's say you do, do that same thing and you only sleep five hours and you're like, oh, God, my legs hurt so bad. Um, sleep is super important. It's not, I mean, it allows your body to rebuild and recuperate from the day before. Yeah. Um, nutrition, which I just talked about. Um, I, got, I got to hit you on sleep because uh, yeah. that's, that's always funny for me. I yeah. don't get enough sleep. Uh, my, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Jorge always, <laughs> always talks to me about, uh, how important it is for me to get more sleep. So I kind of want to stay on that one for yeah, a second, for sure. because that's going to be, um, one of the things that people are going to say, well, how do I get that more sleep? Uh, what is the, the hour range for the most benefits of sleep? What would you say? Is it six hours or seven hours? What's that range for the most so, benefits? Everybody's a little different. There's, and it depends too on what's going on. Like if we have somebody who they're struggling with some adrenal issues, they need more sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've, I have some people, they, they need nine hours of sleep every night. Wow. It's be super cool. But, um, and then you've got <laughs> to take into happened. account, like, do you have young kids at home? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Do you have a stressful job? And that gets into mm-hmm. like boundary setting and all of that. But, yeah. um, probably you're going to, you want to average seven to eight hours. Okay. Uh, there's a really good, um, I think it's a TED Talk, technically. Mm-hmm. Um, what is his name? Matthew Walker, I believe his name. Okay. He's basically talking mm-hmm. about how important sleep is. Um, he talks about all these different immune system things that are happening where you, even if you get 30 minutes less than what you need, mm-hmm. how your immune system is taxed. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it truly is super, super important. Mm. Um, if you want to get on the hormonal level side of it, um, so it was progesterone drops in perimenopause because mm. it's the first thing that drops and it's often mm. why sleep happens or sleep uh, disparities happen. So it's struggling to fall asleep at night. They toss and turn. Yeah. Their brain is racing. They might mm. feel more anxiety. Or it's they wake up at 3, 4 a.m. and they're like, and I'm awake. Okay. Yeah. And you just sit there. And it's because progesterone drops. Right. So when we supplement with progesterone, it actually releases, like through the metabolism of it, uh, this neurotransmitter called GABA. And GABA mm. is incredibly important for calming and sleep. Um, so we have women that like their sleep turns around just from that. Wow. But you get into also, okay, let's turn the lights off because blue light that is received by a retina, you know, causes your cortisol to go up and it drops your melatonin. Um, you can get into not doing hard workouts within two mm -hmm. hours of bed, not eating close to, I mean, all these different lifestyle changes that you can add in one at a time to improve your sleep. Yeah. Um, that, was a, that was a good yeah. one too because uh, I always hear, you know, well, uh, I don't get enough sleep because my kids – well, remember, your kids need sleep, too, mm -hmm. for their brain development, brain function, yes. for their hormones. Yes. So it's not just about, you know, preservation of yourself to sleep. Your kids also need sleep, too. Mm -hmm. So trying to find ways for both of you to set those uh, those boundaries to get the most sleep you can is, is important. Yeah. But, yeah, okay, so then you were going to exercise next, and that's yeah. that's uh, that's my favorite, of course. Uh, but but I didn't want to I didn't want to speed past that sleep one because that's one I struggle with. Yeah. And uh, and I make every excuse in the book. Everybody does. <laughs> yeah. I mean, truly, mm -hmm. it's especially people who are like a little more driven and high functioning. They're like, it's fine. I, right, like, right. You grew up in this generation of you got to do more. You mm -hmm. got to just like power right. through, like sleep. It's it's fine. Like mm -hmm. you got to fix this first and then you then you can sleep. It's fine. I only right. need four hours. You feel like garbage, but you're so used to feeling like garbage. You're like, eh. Facts, yeah. facts. Well, yeah. Yeah. okay. Well, it was so so exercise, which yes. is where uh, E2M Fitness comes in, all right. <laughs> and also uh, our strength training, like Anya was mentioning, E2M Premium, shameless plug, <laughs> wink, wink, foot stump. But okay, exercise. Yes. How can exercise help them with the symptoms of menopause? So exercise is important. So this is going to vary by the individual. So if you you take someone off the street who they might be walking twenty minutes a day. And it's, they're walking from their car to the office and maybe they're walking their dog. They're not doing any strength training. They've never really done strength training. Um, maybe they've done some cardio off and on because you get into like the cardio bunny trend and like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. And, um, but strength training, I am a huge advocate for it. Um, both because on the hormonal side, but also you get into like the mental and like just the self-confidence side. So on the hormone side, because that's what I'm here for. But um, as you strength train and as you build muscle, um, it is hormonally and scientifically proven that the more muscle mass you have, the more metabolism you have, which metabolism is simply the balance of things building up and things breaking down. It is, that is it. It is not like you can speed up your metabolism and whatever. That's not a thing. It is simply how much muscle mass do you have because mm. muscle requires more energy than fat mm. um, compared to muscle or to compared to fat. And so if you strength train, you are building up more muscle, which in turn makes it easier for weight loss and you can eat more things that you want to eat. Um, but also on the bone density side. Yeah. So for a while, bone density was, oh, just go run, just go walk, do some sort of cardio where there's impact, which yes, but – if you strength train, you're actually putting tension on the bone. You're putting mm. tension on the muscle, which is directly affecting the bone needing to rebuild. Mm. So you've got, okay, let's improve our hormones. Let's elevate testosterone. Let's elevate DHEA, which is going to help balance out too much cortisol. Um, it's going to make me feel better. It's going to increase my sex drive. Um, but also let's improve our bone density. Um, on the cardiovascular side, cardio, whatever you want to call it, I, that's also very important mm. when you're getting into actual cardiovascular health. Um, zone two cardio is this thing we talk about a lot, which the easiest way, if you don't have a heart rate monitor, the easiest way to do is, can you do whatever cardio workout you're doing and still kind of sort of carry on a conversation? You might be okay. a little breathy, but can you still talk? Okay. That's zone two. If you're getting past that, you're getting into an elevation of cortisol and all these other hormone releases. Um, but I like to talk about, okay, let's, let's shoot for five days a week of some sort of exercise. And Screw that it. exercise intensity is going to vary person to person. Like you yeah. can't take someone who's never lifted and be like, cool, go deadlift your body weight. That's 
not going to work. 100%. So we're like, okay, let's just make sure you can do the movement correctly and like get those muscles activating the way they're supposed to be. Um, I like to talk about strength training three times a week, cardio two times a week. I like it. Um, that, that's that's kind of kind of along the lines of my program. Eh? Wink, wink, program. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Huh? Yeah. So, okay, good. Yep. All right. So exercise, of course, we all know we need that, man, for so many good things. And let's talk about the the third one. You you mentioned sleep. You hit exercise, and you also talked about nutrition. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one especially um, hard for a lot of people uh, to 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 have proper nutrition. So let's talk about how that proper nutrition can help them out with those uh, yep. hormone symptoms. I mean, um, menopause symptoms. Yeah. Uh, so nutrition, I always tell people prioritize protein, fruits, and veggies, um, which is incredible. Hold on, hold, hold on. Honey. <laughs> you said protein, fruits, and what now? And veggies. Oh man. People don't eat vegetables. No. They don't eat vegetables. A side of French fries is not, no. <laughs> a side of French fries or coleslaw is, no. not, is not it. You no. got to eat more vegetables and, than that. And but I'm ahead. guilty of it as well. Um, yeah, yeah. I, like I was a mm. super picky eater growing up. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I ate some things, but it, I had to really be like, I just, you just got to suck it up. You got to eat it and mm-hmm. find ways yeah. to hide it. And, um, like, I think kale is the most disgusting thing in the world. <laughs> I will eat, I will make kale chips and eat them, but otherwise, like, do not give me kale. I won't do it. Um, so. Bring out the kale. No. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll, like, force myself. Yeah. I'm like, this is gross. Um, so, yeah. So, protein, which you can get all into, okay, well, how much protein do I need? I see, like, 0.8 milligrams mm-hmm. per bot. The easiest way to think about protein, especially somebody who is just struggling to get enough, mm-hmm. is you want to shoot for one gram of protein per pound of body weight. Mm-hmm. It's the easiest way to do math. Um, you can get on to like, are you a bodybuilder and what? Mm-hmm. It, so I, yeah, I, I am. I am curious about yeah. that one because I think a lot of people get stressed out about that. Is yes. that per pound of just the body weight on the scale yes. or amount of muscle mass? I tell people body weight mm-hmm. on the scale okay. because most people aren't gonna. They're not gonna go do a DEXA mm-hmm. scan and really. I mean, mm-hmm. some people might. Most people mm-hmm. aren't. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I say, okay, let's shoot for. So I'm 120 pounds, so Mm -hmm. I want to shoot for 120 milligrams of protein per day. I like to, I try to get more because I lift weights. Most days I probably don't get that. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't eat enough meat that you get on to whatever, but I tell people, I'm like, okay, if you're barely getting 40 milligrams a day, let's, okay, this week, let's increase that by 20 milligrams. Yeah. And we, or 20 grams. Um, And we go from there. Um, Mm -hmm. Protein is so important for things more than just muscle it is yeah. also metabolism it is also functioning of your gut it's getting your brain to work i mean so many different things so i am curious i'm gonna yeah. dig i'm gonna dig on this one because a lot of people Let's will go. run off with this comment and be like well i weigh 240 pounds i'm out of shape does that mean i need to get 240 pounds of uh, 240 grams of protein no yeah, uh, and see, and see, yeah. and see that. That's why we got to hit this stuff because sometimes people, you know, they listen to podcasts mm-hmm. and they may pull the wrong thing. They're like, "I'm not eating enough protein." Yep. My scale says I weigh 240 pounds, but you're you're also 60 pounds overweight. That part. So should you be eating the pound, the weight that you're you're on the scale? So kind of talk about that. Yeah. I, I, I like I said, I just I know these podcasts. I <laughs> no, know people. Sure. Gra- they grab one little uh-huh. thing and they run off with yep. it. And so, and then you know, like with my program. I try to get people used to eating a balanced diet. Yes. And so I don't have them focus so much on like, oh, I got to get enough protein. I got, you don't eat vegetables at all. Mm -hmm. So if you go from not eating any vegetables to when you look at, when people go to a restaurant, and I talk about this a lot, you go to a restaurant and you order your dish. People eat it without even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. But when they're in a health and fitness program, they're like, I need more protein. Mm -hmm. Those couple of pieces of chicken strips that, some restaurant chopped in the smaller pieces to put yep. in your pasta dish. Yep. That is nowhere near, yeah. <laughs> nowhere near your daily recommended yeah. uh, needs for protein. And so I just want to make sure people don't grab onto that thing and say, I'm not getting enough protein in this program and then go off and go to some Italian spot and feel like just getting a couple of chunks of chicken is enough. Yeah. So can you kind of talk about that? If they're if they are overweight, out of shape, and they're mm-hmm. trying to get back in shape, what, what do those protein uh, needs look like for them? Yeah. So... I would guess the easiest way to really take, okay, you have somebody who they are 60 pounds overweight, which does can depend on height and you can get in genetics, all that. Take the weight that is, and I hate saying goal weight. I hate it so much, but we'll say goal weight or the weight of like what your frame should be carrying. Yep. Um, so the the easiest way to think about it is like, okay, what was your weight in high school? Yeah. Assuming that you weren't 
overweight or high school and college because that's about where most people tend to be their quote unquote ideal weight. You can get all into doing calculations for it, but I think it's garbage. I think BMI is garbage Um, because by BMI, like for my height, before I started putting on muscle, I was severely underweight. I was like, this is, this is like, this is how big I've been in my life. I'm trying, but. (laughs) I'm doing all I can. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I don't love those calculations. Mm-hmm. Um, I tell people, especially, like, you can get so hung up on that, yeah. but if you have no idea what you're eating, start with that. Like, per- how much per- protein do you get in a day? Perfect. I love that. And that's why, you know, um, I think a lot of people overcomplicate health and fitness. Mm-hmm. Start out with just trying to get a balanced meal of protein, veggies, fruits, and, and you know, healthy fats. And so I, I, I think you really hit on that. So I just, I, I, I know how sometimes mm-hmm. this stuff goes. So I wanted to hit on that one hard. Um, but what other things when it comes to nutrition, should they, is, does a person that's going through menopause need to have a totally different diet than somebody that's not? Like, and that's, and that's what we get questions on a lot. We get questions on, well, hey, uh, uh, what should I be eating? Because I'm going through menopause. Should I be eating something different? Is there a radically different diet that somebody that's going through menopause should be eating? The exact same thing. Oh, 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 hold on. Say, say, say that, that again. Say what I say what I The exact same thing. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Got you. So yeah. a balanced diet. <laughs> yeah. Um, Got you. Pro- if anything, protein needs increase as you age. Got you. Um, your body actually doesn't metabolize protein as well as you age. Um, so you need more. Um, 100%. So, yeah. And I will say... I, like sad common people, like they get stuck on this one thing. Most people don't like to be held accountable. No, and if true. they do, they claim they do, but it's because like, oh, this is my goal. And they aren't actually addressing, okay, well, why can't I do this thing? These people that jump from fad diet to fad diet to fad exercise, whatever, it's like, well, this is the new thing. This thing didn't work for the three weeks that I did yeah. it. So let me try this thing. This That didn't work for me. Okay, let me try this thing. Um, I've had a couple people who they come to us and they're like, why well, did this thing? Yeah. I'm like, but you didn't. I'm like you, <laughs> you didn't actually did. actually do it. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you claimed you mm, did, and like you went right. through the motions, but you didn't sit down and you didn't have that hard conversation with yourself of True. like, I should really order a side of broccoli without the cheese sauce. Yeah. Um, instead of getting like you know these delicious seasoned French fries, <laughs> like there comes right. a time where you're enough like you're gonna have to suck it up and be an adult. Or and like yes, there's a time also to have the delicious treats. But if you're trying to do what's best for nutrition and your body, fueling your body, I like to talk about, I don't like to talk about diet. I talk about nutrition and fueling your body. And I think with women, especially, that is a number one conversation where I have to get them to change their mindset Mm -hmm. because in their mind, they're like, well, you exercise more, you eat less. And that's what it is. Um, and they get so stuck on like, oh, I have to eat 2000 calories or I have to go down. No, you aren't eating enough. I love it. Uh, focused on focused yeah. on getting balanced meals and trying to get more uh, more fruits and vegetables, healthy fats, and lean proteins, or vegan proteins if they're not mm-hmm. into eating meat. Yep. Just trying to get more of those balanced things in. And and I think like I was saying earlier, and that's why I wanted to stomp stuff, foot stomp on that <laughs> one. It's just like people aren't even getting a balanced diet. Don't yep. worry so much about how many grams of protein you need yeah. when you're not even getting a balanced diet. You gotta gotta crawl before you try to run, try yep. to sprint. Yeah. Focusing on hitting your macros for protein every day mm-hmm. is like graduate level. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just just start out with trying to eat a balance uh the same way, you know, uh, you know, you have a plate. On that plate, yep. you should have a colorful plate. You mm-hmm. should have, you know, proteins and veggies and fruits and, and lean uh lean lean meats and healthy vegetables, that kind of stuff. Yep. So okay. So this is the part that I don't want people to miss, all right? Yes. Let's say somebody is really, you know, focused on wanting to learn as much as they can about menopause. You know, they, they're into it. That's why they're watching this podcast. People are curious. They want to know more. Um, they're curious of what's going on with their body is actually menopause or if it's some other kind of hormone or like you were saying during the COVID time, like yeah. is this symptoms, post-COVID symptoms that confuses things. When, when should somebody seek medical advice what at what point would you recommend whenever you have questions like truly and and unfortunately with traditional medic like the medical system it's really difficult to actually get an answer um and women tend to get like shoved aside and say whatever but i would say as soon as you start feeling like i just don't feel like myself um 
if you are like somebody, I hate going to the doctor. My blood pressure always goes up every time I go. Cool. Start with the sleep. Start with the exercise. Start with the nutrition. But let's say you're, you're like, I'm doing everything and I still feel terrible. Go see somebody. Um, ideally, come see us. But. <laughs> no, and, that, and that's a, but that's a good point. And you know, I know, I know, not everybody you know can afford private health care, yes, and yeah. they have to use insurance and things like that. They don't get as many choices. But um, I'm, I'm here to tell you, you know, there are certain things that um, if you have the right medical providers. Uh, whenever I go into Companion Health, it's a great experience for me. Um, that's that's my that's my doctor. So uh, Anya is one of the people that sees me and gives me IVs and all kind of <laughs> cool stuff. And so um, so just you know, if you're uncomfortable uh, with asking those questions to your medical uh, providers, you know, I would highly encourage you to seek uh, another one. Find somebody that you feel more comfortable with asking those questions. Those, that's your health. Um, so, so I don't want to leave here without plugging uh, Companion Health because, you know, you guys were so so cool about having you here, taking the time out of your your normal day when you could be seeing patients to be here to do this podcast. So I really want you to to you know talk about Companion Health and give them a little background on on yeah. where you work. So um, Companion Health, we are a primary care functional medicine concierge kind of hybrid. Um, we, both Dr. Orr and I came from a traditional primary care setting where we had, you know, we were cranking out patients all day long and it was miserable. It was miserable for most patients. It was miserable for us. Um, we couldn't actually practice medicine, which was affecting us, um, very much so because we love medicine and we love figuring out the puzzle and we just watched like the decline of so many people that we came to know and we couldn't do what we needed to do. So we decided, we're like, okay, well, we have to do something different. We were trying to integrate some of this functional medicine into um, what we were doing, and it, we just didn't have the time for it. Mm. Uh, so we, now we do we do primary care still. We write medicines. We do all of that. But we can do some of these other advanced testing. Yep. We can do salivary or urine testing, and we can look, actually, what are your hormones doing? We can take the time and sit down and say, okay, well, tell me about, like, what's going on with you. We have health coaches that help to get, I call it all the life stuff to help all the medical stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we do specialty testing and we can take all that and say, okay, we can look at this whole big picture of stuff happening and we can really like take the time to sit down and say, okay, let's work on this, let's work on this, let's work on this. And we can do the whole puzzle. Our mm -hmm. body is this massive system that's very integrated. It is not just your thyroid. It is not just a cold. It is not just this one thing. It is all these things playing off of each other. So yeah, we get to really do medicine and help people and, you know, people feel better. I love it. So, uh, how can, so how can somebody reach out to you guys? How can they find you? They've heard this podcast. They, they came to the conference because people asked about you after the <laughs> conference. They were yeah. super, super impressed. So how can they, uh, they reach out to you and Dr. Jorge Companion Health? How can they get in contact with you guys? Now we'll, we'll also put this in the description. Uh, of the video, and we'll also put on the screen, so you can probably see it on the screen right now. It's at the <laughs> bottom of the screen, uh, but uh, I'll let you also verbally tell them. Yeah, so uh, probably the easiest way is going to be going to our website, uh, companionhealthnc.com. Um, there's a questionnaire somewhere on there uh, that will get you to uh, Ellen, who is our business director, and she'll talk with everything about uh, you know how we work, what our programs look like. Um, but I also want to say, because I'm also – super kind of passionate about not everybody can afford to come see us. Mm -hmm. Um, and I want everybody to have like the opportunity to do something for themselves and to feel better. So, um, I have an Instagram that I'm awful about posting on. Um, but I have one specifically for kind of the medical side where I try to, uh, post videos and little tidbits of information. Um, I also will post some things on, uh, companion health YouTube. Um, cool. but you know, there's some books and uh, that I highly recommend. Um, okay. I will make sure that you guys have those as well. Um, there's a great podcast, all sorts of information. But um, let's say you can't come see somebody or you live out of state, whatever it is, um, talk to your normal primary care. If they're cool. like, I know what you're talking about. I think that's garbage. Ask your friends. Like, there's Facebook forums for all this stuff. Ask yeah. them. Like, get recommendations set up a console. And if you go see somebody, you're like, oh, they just dismissed me or I don't know, they give me the creeps, whatever it is, go see somebody else. Like you're allowed to ask questions. You're allowed to advocate for yourself. Don't be shoved aside. Um, I'm also super passionate about women. Like 
do the thing. Um, I love it. Don't, you don't have to like be this meek little person. Um, even if it's scary, it's the yeah. only way you're going to feel better. And we will put your Instagram at the bottom, uh, also in the description. And so closing out. Yes. Anya Wallace, this has been great. So I was in a different, uh, and this I know we got to close it up, but I was in a different um, breakout session when you were doing your menopause section. And so I come out of my se- I come out of my my segment. You know, I was in there watching somebody else, and everybody was talking about this. <laughs> so we'll definitely have you back because yeah. I know this is a very complicated topic to talk about. Yeah. So we'll definitely have you back. Uh, we appreciate you. Yeah, we're we're right. super impressed with your knowledge base. And we'll dig into this based on the questions that are asked uh, from this podcast. So if you have a bunch of questions from this podcast, we will have a follow-up. We'll take a look at some of the things that we hear and people ask. And we'll do a follow-up. So we'll do a part two uh, to have an Anya awesome. Wallace here. And so thank you, Anya. Thank you. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll see you soon. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Have a good day. Take care.